Is unwanted amplifier noise preventing you from slaying puss and riding the next stairway to heaven? Has your noise floor become an overwhelming nightmare that keeps you awake at night? Are you hearing talk radio pundits and classic rock emanating from your guitar rig like some kind of scuffed avant-garde acid flashback? Is all this unwanted noise becoming too much and you're thinking about Control-Alt deleting your life? Don't drown yourself in the toilet, there's still hope. Hi everybody, my name's Shutik and I'm here to help. Those of you who have fallen down this rabbit hole before know how maddening the process of tracking down unwanted noise can be. It becomes an aggravating obsession that makes you start believing that the tiniest noise sounds like a machine shop accident. There's tons of reasons that tube amps might make undesirable noise, but in this video we're going to focus on the one that was plaguing me, radio frequency interference. Specifically, it was that my low quality cables weren't doing a good job of rejecting that interference. Today we're gonna to cover what RFI is, understand the steps needed to figure out where RFI enters the signal chain, and talk about the components of an unbalanced audio cable. Finally, I'll show you how easy it is to build and solder your own high quality RFI resistant cables that can be used with any instrument that uses quarter inch plugs. What we're not going to be doing is a cable shootout to figure out which cables have the best tone. That kind of stuff is insane and is the exact wrong way to frame a discussion about good cables. We're not trying to get better tone with a guitar cable. We're trying to find a cable that is completely transparent and neither adds to nor subtracts from our sound. I want a cable that has no impact whatsoever on the sound of my guitar. Before we start, it's important to remember that your gear is never going to be completely silent. The goal is to reduce unwanted noise without sacrificing the sonic quality of your guitar and its pickups. This will require some level of balance. You'll need to be reasonable with your obsession. The majority of your time should be spent playing music, not obsessing over noises that almost no one else will notice. RFI or radio frequency interference is a disturbance generated by an external source that affects an electrical circuit by electromagnetic induction, electrostatic coupling, or conduction. In layman's terms, it's when an unwanted signal gets picked up in your signal chain and is then amplified by your equipment. RFI can present itself as anything from a persistent hiss to a digital cacophony reminiscent of a dial-up modem in the 1990s. RFI can come from a wide variety of electronic sources, with each having somewhat unique sonic symptoms. Common sources include cell phones, cell phone towers, power lines, computers, radio broadcasts, Wi-Fi routers, and fluorescent lighting. I've even heard wacky stories about things like digital thermostats causing RFI noise. Anything that transmits a signal is a potential source of RFI. RFI can enter your signal chain at one of three primary points, your amp, your cables, or your guitar. Today's video focuses on cables, but I'll give a broad summary of some primary causes of RFI and what their most common solutions are. First up is your guitar. RFI is picked up by your pickups and sent downstream. You can minimize the amount of RFI introduced inside your guitar by shielding all cavities, including those where your pickups are mounted. This can be done with copper foil or graphite paint. Do yourself a favor and go for the graphite paint. It'll give you a cleaner, more professional looking end result. It's a lot less frustrating to apply and won't peel over time. Sometimes you can mitigate noise that's being picked up by your guitar by changing the direction you're facing or moving further away from a potential noise source. Fluorescent lights are a big culprit here, so be on the lookout for those. Those used to make playing gigs at the local Walmart a noisy affair. Thankfully, fluorescents are largely being replaced by LEDs these days. It's worth noting that while some single coil pickups are quieter than others, they all inherently have some level of noise. This is called single coil hum. Usually you're better off living with this specific type of noise rather than squashing your signal with a noise gate or heavy EQ. Next up is your amp. The most common reason for RFI in your amp would be grounding issues. Simple fix here is to make sure the chassis is properly grounded. If the grounding checks out and you're still getting noise, try moving the location of your amp and see if that helps. You could also try shielding the interior of the cabinet using graphite paint. Last is your cables. 
Cables with poor shielding or shoddy construction can act as an antenna, picking up all kinds of radio frequencies. You might find that coiling the cable makes it noisier than having it unfurled. Longer cables will be more susceptible to noise than shorter ones. If the quality of your cable sucks, there isn't a whole lot you can do to salvage it. Thankfully, making a new cable with high quality materials won't break the bank. So you strum in the old git box and you hear in noises. How do you figure out where it's coming from? First, power up your amp with no cables plugged into it. Make sure it isn't in standby. Do you hear the noise? If the answer is yes, your amplifier is the source of your noise and you should begin your investigation there. I plan on making videos that cover this in the future, but for the time being, we're going to assume that your amp isn't making the noise and we'll keep walking through the troubleshooting process. Next, plug in your cable and listen for the noise. This can be tough because the cable might exhibit some level of noise if it isn't grounded on one side. To mitigate this, you can plug it into a stomp box. The stomp box doesn't need to be connected to power. Do you hear the noise? If the answer is yes, your cable is likely what is picking up unwanted RF noise. If you still don't hear the noise, plug in your guitar and turn the volume up. Make sure you remove the stomp box if you use that to provide a ground connection in the previous step. Rest your hands across the strings to mute them. Do you hear the noise now? If the answer is yes, you'll need to figure out what about your guitar is making all this ruckus. When I followed these steps, I found out that as soon as I plugged the cable in between the amp and the stomp box, the noise would appear. What drove me nuts was that it wasn't always there. On one of the occasions that it did manifest, I went so far as to flip every other breaker in the house and turn off all the phones in order to identify the source of the noise. Even with everything off, the noise was still there. I was in a mania. This is what that noise sounded like. I unplugged the cable from the amp and then nothing. That's when I realized that the cable was picking up the sound and that the root cause of my problem was outside of my house and more importantly, outside of my control. It's at this point that I did some research and determined that a better quality cable could possibly solve my issues. So let's talk about the components of a good guitar cable. When looking at a cable to buy or build, you'll notice that not all cables contain all of these parts. E-Home Recording Studio has an excellent article on guitar cable construction, which I've linked to in the description for those of you who want to dive deeper into the subject. A quality guitar cable contains the following layers. First is the center conductor. This is the layer that carries the audio signal via electrical current. You want this to be a stranded wire and not a solid conductor. Solid conductors are less flexible and more susceptible to breaking. Typically, stranded conductors come in 26 strands of 34 AWG wire, otherwise known as 2634, or 41 strands of 36 AWG, or 4136. 4136 is more expensive and considered the superior option when it comes to flexibility and strength. The insulation encapsulates the center conductor, keeping it isolated from other parts. The electrostatic shield helps to reduce handling noise when the cable is flexed or compressed. Next up is the braided copper shield. This is the layer that blocks interference from outside sources. This will be critical in eliminating RFI. The good cables have an additional shield for added RF protection. Last is the outer jacket which protects everything inside. While not a particularly exciting layer, it can come in different colors which is neat. For the quarter inch TS or tip sleeve plug, there are tons of different options. Here are a few features to consider with plugs. First, there's the contact material. You'll find options for silver, nickel, and gold plated. These will all offer up the same levels of connectivity. Gold does hold an advantage as it's resistant to corrosion. They all sound the same. Other options include silent plugs, right angle plugs, and plugs with different types of strain relief. You should be aware that instrument cables and speaker cables are not interchangeable. Instrument cables are designed for low power and low impedance. This type of cable uses a smaller gauge wire and has shielding to reduce RF noise. They're also more flexible, which helps facilitate movement around a stage. 
Speaker cables are designed for high power and high impedance. Inside this type of cable are two equal size, larger gauge conductors. You won't find any shielding in these ones. Using a speaker cable as an instrument cable can introduce RF noise due to the lack of shielding. While this won't sound great, it won't cause any damage. So what about using an instrument cable in place of a speaker cable? Well, the conductor inside the instrument cable is too small to support the amount of current you're sending through it. The energy will be converted to heat, which can cause the cable to either break or short one wire to another. Shorting one wire to the other can cause catastrophic damage to your amp. Never use an instrument cable as a speaker cable. This is a cry for help. Please like my video and subscribe to my channel. I'm getting absolutely massacred in the ratings. Since we're building our own cables from scratch, we can afford to buy the best of the best materials. I purchased my stuff from Redco Audio. They have a really great selection there. I'll be starting with 10 feet of Gotham GAC-1 Ultra Pro cable. This cable provides RF protection via a double reuse and shield. A reuse and shield is two separate spiral shields wound in opposite directions so that the layer strands are at 90 degree angles to one another. This will provide us with protection against radio frequency interference. This cable also has a conductive PVC layer over the conductor's insulation, which allows any static buildup to leak to the shield and be grounded before it has any harmful effects. The goal here is to reduce microphonics. These microphonics usually manifest themselves as a crackling noise when you move the cable around. For this cable, I'll be using Nutric NP2X quarter inch male connectors. You can buy colored boots for these to make it easier to identify cables in your jam packed home studio environment. The total cost to build this top of the line 10 foot unbalanced instrument cable is 21 US dollars in 2023. First, we're going to cut the cable to length. I trust you can figure this step out on your own. If you can't figure out how to measure and cut the cable, you're absolutely and I can't help you. Call your mother, a priest, or a shrink so they can try to figure something out for you. It's generally recommended you keep your cable to 20 feet or less. Anything greater than that and you'll start to run into capacitance issues. The greater length will begin to reduce your signal and suck the tone from your guitar. If you need to run more than 20 feet, you're going to want to look for a balanced cable solution. Now for some prep work. You should thread the plug bodies and the insulators onto the cable. You could add these on after the first plug is soldered, but once you start soldering the second one, you'll be out of luck. I can't tell you how many times I've forgotten to do this and had to undo all my work. I do this up front now to save me the frustration. We need to cut away the outer jacket to get to the wire inside. For this, I use an X-Acto knife or a razor blade. I hold the cable end inside the plug for a visual indication of how much of the jacket I need to remove. You need to leave enough of the jacket for the plastic insulator to be able to bite into the jacket. Use light to medium pressure to cut into the jacket without cutting the shielding beneath it. Now separate the shielding to one side and twist it up. Next, trim down the conductive shielding. You don't want this part to come into contact with the conductor wire or else it will cause grounding issues. Now trim down the white jacket over the conductor wire. Give that conductor wire a good twist. Now tin the conductor wire. Now tin the ground wire. Next trim down the ground wire but leave roughly half or so. Let's get to the soldering. I've done these without helping hands in the past, but it's a major pain. Do yourself a favor and pick a setup. Use an alligator clip to secure the plug. The first part we're going to solder is the conductor wire like so. Now push the ground wire down toward the sleeve of the plug. Solder it. Nice job, Shutik. Everybody loves you. Pull up the insulator and then screw on the plug body. Rinse and repeat for the other end of the cable. Once it's all put together, I like to check the cable using a multimeter making sure that there is continuity between the sleeve on each end and the tip on each end. Make sure there is no continuity between the sleeve and tip on either side. 
I've bought an unbelievable amount of cables over the last 20 years, and most of them have been garbage. They were low quality cables that I thought were good at the time. I realized later that these weren't even worth attempting to salvage. The funny thing is, I have never had problems with the cables I've built myself. It's always the old commercial ones I have kicking around that fail. This is partly that they're older and mostly that they're poorly constructed and made of cheap materials. Understanding what a guitar cable is made of has helped me select the best components and eliminated annoying problems like RFI. By building them myself, I can quickly troubleshoot and solve problems. There are times when you'll be troubleshooting noise in an amp and you can leverage concepts about shielding and grounding in cables to help find the source of a problem. It's also nice having the materials on hand so you can make patch cables whenever you need them. So, should you be building your own cables? Absolutely. That said, don't just go out and buy a bunch of cable and connectors for the hell of it. Only build them if your existing cables have issues or if you need more cables. That's a great opportunity to buy a little more materials than you need, so then you'll have some of everything on hand for when you need it. Definitely don't do this because you think it's going to improve your tone. That's just another way to spend less time playing music and more time cork sniffing. If you can't identify an actual problem with your cables, you're all set. Chill out. Save your money. Play your guitar. I give making your own cables five stars.